Hey everybody, what is going on? Welcome to the morning grind here on rotogrinders.com. I am not Stevie. No, I am not. I am Dan Bach. The old the old school grinders know who I am. I used to do a podcast back in the day. Now I've moved up into the corner office and you know I break down numbers, but the opportunity to talk with the CEO of what is clearly the fastest growing and arguably the largest daily fantasy company uh, out there today, it, it brought me back to my roots. So I needed to uh, dust off the pipes a little bit, bring back the radio voice because Adam Wexler from prize picks is going to join us. And today we're going to have a fun conversation talking about new products, their journey to the successful um, point that they, that they're at today, what the future has in store. So let's jump on in with it. Adam Wexler, my man, it's been a it's been a long time that you you and I have gone back 2014, 15 around there when you were doing side prize. And here we are today, prize picks, arguably, I, I don't want to say definitively, but arguably the largest daily fantasy company uh, in the space today. What a journey, my man. How are you? Doing really well. Good to see you, Dan. Good to be good to be back and and, and always enjoy a good conversation here. Definitely. And before we get into the journey, I do want to start the show talking about uh, a new product release because I am super excited and I'm very much um, biased here because I live in Tennessee and I have not been able to play prize picks until today, until this morning. I get the press release that says prize picks arena is here, a new version of prize picks that is moving into West Virginia, Tennessee, Wyoming and Alabama and it's a peer versus peer version of the game that people have come to love uh, all throughout the country. Explain to me a little bit about Price Picks Arena, why you guys did it, and exactly you know how this works. Because uh, I think in my initial experience with it, it's not too much different from what I was playing, you know, in Florida a year and a half ago when I was on Price Picks. No, that's <clears throat> that's exactly correct. Um, you know, obviously we started the business out of Atlanta. Um, you know. I often describe, you know, our focus as being, you know, Atlanta rooted, but Southern focused. And and yet there were certain states that we could not serve, um, you know, specifically because of the way, you know, that fantasy laws were constructed or, or licensing requirements. And specifically in, in Tennessee, um, that was one of those states where it, it's been made, you know, clear to us over time that uh, peer to peer was a necessity. Uh, and Tennessee's not alone. There, there's a number of states throughout the country that, uh, you know, have made it pretty clear that the only way that we were going to be able to operate there with a real money game would be peer to peer. And so, you know, we've always had it in mind that our, our flagship game uh, that where we've been able to serve, you know, roughly 30 states, about 70 percent of the country. Uh, at some point, we were going to want to expand our map. Uh, and, and, you know, 2023 is when we really got moving on on, uh, you know, innovation you know, in that direction. And, uh, you know, we released a, a free-to-play product uh, in Michigan, uh, you know, last fall. And then the big one that we've had in the works for a while now is this peer-to-peer -peer concept. And we brought in uh, some really great talent to help help lead the, lead the charge here. You know, I think, Dan, you may know Brian Huss. You know, he's got a hell of a resume himself. He used to lead, you know, CBS Fantasy. And at, at one point in time, he was also at, at our friends at, with our friends at FanDuel, uh, you know, among other stops. And uh, so who better to, you know, really lead the charge related to a product like this than somebody like Brian, who's, who's seen it all. Um, and to your point, you know, we wanted to make it as, as close to resembling our, our flagship game as possible. And, you know, we wanted the experience to be as, as close to that as possible. And uh, I think the guys did a really great, great job of, of accomplishing just that. Yeah, I threw some entries in for today. I'm excited to see kind of what the sweat experience is around it compared to to what it is previously, because instead of competing against you know the house per se, we're competing against other people who have the same buy in entry as as I do, the same number of um and of you know and en entry legs as I do. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, not only are you like sweating your own, but you're kind of hoping the people you're playing lose, which is very different than the current iteration where everybody is just uh, all about their own entries and, and, and trying to beat prize picks. But um, I, I think the, the one component that I think is different from what we've seen underdog do something similar to this DraftKings rolled something out is that I saw that you are matching with skill level. 
And that's an, a component that I have not seen elsewhere. And I'm wondering why you felt like that was an important uh, piece of the product here when you rolled out this peer to peer aspect of this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the bigger things is, you know, we, we want people to, you know, keep coming back. Right. And so what we, what we experienced in the first wave of DFS, I'm, I've been in the industry long enough to recall those days is that, you know, when you're, when you're playing against sharks every single day, it's not the most fun experience. And, and in our case, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we want to be able to match people up that have similar experience levels, you know, playing our game, but also sim similar success levels. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are just doing it for the fun of it that are just trying to, you know, have some action down and make the games, you know, the games on the court, the field more that much more exciting. There's other people that are really trying to profit off of this on a day in, day out basis. And and so being cognizant of that and, and having people involved in the, you know, formulation of this product that, you know, really date back in the DFS community um, def definitely was a big consideration as well. So we're going four states with this. And one thing that I, I think is going to be important for this product is to reach scale because again we're matching we're matching users up. So the more people you have, the the more contests you can be in. The um, you know the because the, the the one experience you don't want is you know people trying to play and then not having enough people to play against. So where does this kind of fall in terms of the uh, the future of prize picks? I mean, we'll get into some of the regulatory stuff that's happening out there, but could you see in in a few years time, like this really scaling as the product on prize picks, or is this simply a measure of, you know, trying to, to increase the map and, and understanding that like there's regulatory uh, requirements that we have to follow. And this is a way for us to follow. Yeah. You mentioned four right now, by no means are we, we're stopping at those four. Uh, don't be surprised if we have more, you know, announcements in the coming, you know, months here. Um, because to your point, we definitely want to expand the pool. <clears throat> um, you know, in, in general, uh, you know, one of the main objectives is to you know maximize our map, especially with real money contests. I don't know uh, offhand kind of what that should look like, but what I can tell you is it's it's got to be north of eighty percent of the country that we should be able to serve with a real money game. Um, obviously, beyond that, um, you know, I, I think we also want to expand our map as it relates to free to play because at the end of the day. We want as many people to be able to play these player prediction games, build lineups on a nightly basis with prize picks uh, and be a part of the general experience. But uh, but yeah, to your other to your other question, um, you know, look, we, we've got our flagship game. There's a reason that we've become number one. Um, so, you know, if we don't if we don't have to remove that game from a particular state, I don't think we intend to. But we think we've got a pretty good backup plan uh, in, in any event that we may run into. Well said. Uh, I want to just kind of talk about this journey a little bit and who prize picks is today, where you guys came from, because uh, I've seen it from the beginning. Uh, I've been very clear in other podcast interviews that uh, I was not a believer um, long ago. You know, you even came up to me and said, Dan, would you like to, you know, might have room on the, the cap table for you. Are you interested? And that's one of the biggest mistakes I think I've ever made in my financial life. Um, and the sad thing is uh, you looked at the game very differently than I did at the time and saw the flaws that maybe existed in the salary cap game. And uh, for me, kudos to you and the team, because I, I didn't see this coming. So my, I want to start with this question because I, I hear it all the time on these commercials. I listen to the NBA NFL broadcast when I'm driving my kids around all over the place. Prize picks is a monster sponsor. 7 million people have played prize. Pick. 7 million people. Well, what is the number? How big is prize picks. How many users have you guys signed up? Because 7 million is a number uh, way above what I was, was expecting it to be. I don't know. I don't know if I can share numbers, um, but let's just say. Uh, Gotta be at least seven, right? Like, I mean, you said it on the commercial, right? Uh, our, our database exceeds 7 million. I can confirm that. Um, and uh, we, we, we're, we, we've got some interesting milestones, uh, you know, in front of us as, as, as we wrap up this football season. But uh, let's just say uh, probably the, the thing that impresses me and the thing that I'm probably most proud of uh, about our adoption is actually our, our retention and how many people are, are active on a monthly basis. I mean, there's a seven figure number that are active on a monthly basis playing our game. And uh, it just speaks to, you know, 
we found product market fit. I think that's pretty clear. It speaks to the fact that sports fans around the country really just want to enhance their viewing experience. And that's exactly how we're positioning the product. So what was the ex- inflection point for you where it like completely turned? Because those early days of prize picks, you can acknowledge they were tough. I mean, it took a lot of time for this product to get to a point where, you know, we've seen widespread adoption. I mean, this is not a new business. You started, what, 2015, I think, twenty right around there, 2015, 2016. And I think just within the last three to four years, we've seen just the momentum grow. What was that point for you? And uh, why do you think it's happening? Because again, this isn't a new business. So why now and not eight years ago? Well, I, you know, just to take you all the way back, you know, I got into the industry in 2014. I'm a season long fantasy league consumer myself playing multiple leagues, you know, every fall was my, my, my typical, you know, tradition. Um, and uh, what got me in just to quickly, you know, catch people up is, you know, I would see the the fantasy league commissioner complaining every fall. Nobody wanted to be have that responsibility. Somebody had to step up and do it. And so the original prototype, the original product was helping the fantasy league commissioner collect money from his friends. <clears throat> Quickly realized that that was a very seasonal product. Uh, so we said, what else can we do with this digital treasure? That's what led us to repurposing it for the purposes of, you know, skill-based side bets. You know, th- these were these were things that, you know, friends and leagues were doing with each other. You know, I challenge you, Dan, I'm going to kick your ass. Let's put, you know, a hundred bucks on it. So side prize, our second product built the hooks into the season long platforms and kind of essentially created a daily game or a weekly game for the season long format. And that started walking me down the path of, you know, daily fantasy. I, you know, started paying closer attention to what, you know, the likes of FanDuel and DraftKings were doing, but, you know, I would hear all these complaints about, I never win. You know, it's, it's too hard. Uh, It's too complicated. And, and, and I was one of those consumers who, you know, who was looking at these, looking at these games and saying, I got to know everything about every player. I got to know everything about, about everybody who I'm playing against. You know, it was, there, there was some serious, you know, time requirements, you know, associated with a game like that. So the, 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 the premise was always, you know, can we simplify the concept of daily fantasy? It's a great concept. Everybody loves fantasy sports to begin with, but, you know, can we just simplify it to the point that people can get in and out of, of an app in no time? And, uh, and, you know, ideally you put, put the proper research in so that you give yourself a better shot to win. Uh, and, uh, and so that was where kind of, you know, prize picks got, got, got started. You know, the, the actual original incarnation of prize picks was I'm spending all this time, you know, researching my, my own team in my season long league. I feel very confident that Patrick Mahomes is going to, you know, go over 26 fantasy points that Yahoo's projecting him for or whatever the platform may have been. Uh, but I want to put some real money behind that pred- prediction. And, and so uh, for the first couple of years, you know, all we allowed you to do was predict if they were going to go over or under their fantasy point projection. Uh, and then once, you know, one of our one of one of the other groups in our category at the time, you know, Monkey Knife Fight, our RIP, um, they were the ones who were really pushing the boundaries and, and you know, were doing single statistic, you know, um, you know, over under predictions. And uh, we always knew that that could appeal to a larger number of people. But obviously, you know, we've had to be very cognizant of where the laws and regulations were, you know, at different you know points in time. And and so when when we finally got comfortable with that, ultimately, um, we, 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 we took the leap and, and uh, we haven't looked back. Uh, the one other thing I'd call, call out is that, you know, you talk about times were tough. Times were especially tough when sports around the world turned off, um, you know, right as we were ready to scale up that much further. And, uh, you know, fortunately, you know, we, we righted the ship during 2020 and uh, it was really in 2021 when we, when we stepped on the gas and we haven't looked back since. Yeah. And I think, you know, looking back at even Monkey Knife Fight, for example, uh, versus what you have today is you guys simplified the product so very well within app form, which is one thing I don't think they ever did. And. Uh, I think it speaks volumes to what your goal was because you, you nailed it, like simplifying daily fantasy sports. There's nothing simpler than just having pictures and, you know, stat categories that you need to pick higher or lower. Like that's as easy as it gets. But the user interface, it sounds like it should be easy to develop. Monkey Knife Fight had years to figure it out and they never did. You guys nailed it. And 
was it simply a, a point of, okay, we survived, you know, COVID we've gone through, you know, the, the ups and downs of figuring out the regulatory environment. And then all of a sudden saying, okay, we've got marketing funds and just, and just being able to grow audience that way. Was it, was it as simple as like, once we get users, we feel like this is going to grow. And it was just a matter of finding whether it's investment capital or, or raising to, to just deploy marketing dollars. Was that the key to like developing scale here? So the, the, the simple answer is not, you know, it's not that simple. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a UI UX is a, is a huge part of that. Yeah. I think um, how, on the surface, many people would, would look at the UI and say, this is so easy. I could, I could build this. It's the UX that's the tough part. Uh, you know, what, one thing that we prioritized from the get-go was we're going to deliver a six-star member experience, as, as, as we call it. Um, you know, I, I took pages from different categories of, of, of in different industries. You know, I said we're going to bring an American Express-like level of customer support to this industry that was not used to real-time question and answer. Uh, so I saw that as a very big opportunity. Um you know, sim similarly, we're going to always put our customers first. And so, you know, we, we've done industry leading, you know, policies such as the reboot policy that a lot of people know us for these days that, um, you know, hey, in, in, in traditional sports betting, they would never consider something like that. But they're not the ones creating our game. You know, we are creating a game, enhancing a game with every passing year. And uh, we're doing it with the customer at, at, the, at, at the you know epicenter of it all. And so, um, you know, another uh, small example of, of something that we did that, you know, you may or may not, you know, see as a part of the future, as a part of a continued innovation is what we did with uh, Tyreek Hill. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when he uh, got tackled in the playoffs uh, behind, behind the line of scrimmage and, and all of a sudden he went backwards, uh, he had already hit his projection, but then he went backwards and, and uh, you know, we came in to the rescue for those that were riding with Tariq. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's the least we can do for customers to ensure that they don't have a terrible customer experience. Uh, hey, I lived the Zion Williamson busted shoe promo that that you guys did back in the day. And you guys made good on on every single um, entry that people put that day. And that was a, you know, a, a really eye opening sign to say, hey, this isn't about short term. This is about long term. And, you know, I want to. I don't have the quote in front of me exactly, but we interviewed Nigel, uh, the co-founder of FanDuel, not long ago, and he had some really kind words about prize picks. And one of the things that he said in particular was the one thing prize picks has done better than anybody in this space is they figured out community, uh, which is a testament to you know you and your team. I mean, not too many large businesses out there link their Discord on their apps like you guys do. You've built an amazing Discord community. But beyond that, there's been hundreds of Discord communities about prize picks built separately. And, you know, to me, that is a massive differentiator for your, guy, your guys' product is the tribalism that people have when they play it. And it really resonates. And uh, I think that's been a a huge advantage to you. And I, and I almost think like the timing of it all too really works because, you know, in 2015, 2016, we didn't have discord servers. We didn't have Patreons. The, the, the creator economy, it didn't really exist back then, but it really seems to fit prize picks to a T. And I'm sure you guys have seen that and witnessed it and, and had to absolutely love the fact that, you know, people are, coming together almost, you know, again, building communities, trying to, trying to beat prize picks. I'm sure you guys are all about that, right? Yeah. Well, a couple of things there, you know, no, number one, um, you know, previous iterations of fantasy sports overall were all about competing against other people. And, and the way we kind of approach it knows we, we want, we want to encourage people to play together. You know, it, we, this is a supposed to be a social experience, but it doesn't have to be you against the other person. It can be you with right. the other person. Um, and so it kind of started with that premise from a social point of view. 
But then, you know, we also saw a big opportunity uh, as it related, related to kind of building community, just like you said. And one of the things that we very consciously did was um, we, we, you know, tackled this notion of, of building the community primarily through our dis- through a discord. We saw that as a great platform to kind of it was it almost functioned as like this digital sports bar where everybody could convene, do their kind of research, almost crowdsource their research talk about the the picks and predictions that they were, you know, thinking about making. And then when the games actually took place, sweat it out in a communal fashion. You know, you get to celebrate or sulk, you know, with the community. And um and 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 not only that, but you know, one other thing that I'll kind of edit that you said there is we never wanted to be viewed as as the enemy. You know, at the end at the end of the day, we're we're an entertainment provider. And I think one of the best examples uh, that I can, you know, emphasize that with is what we do for like Taco Tuesday. Right. So we don't have to give these discounts. We don't have to give you a better chance to win, but we want to. We've it's become a tradition with prize picks. And not just that, we want you to determine who's going to get the discounts, who's going to, you know, get the best opportunities to, you know, uh, for those picks to hit because you've got, you know, greater than 50 percent odds on these. And, and so we, we put it up to the to the community to make those determinations and that allows the banter to go back and forth and the explanations about why it would be great to have this discount on that player as opposed to that one. You know, once again, every, everything that we're doing is very, you know, communal oriented. And, uh, and we want to make sure that, um, you know, once again, we're not, we're not viewed as the enemy, but more so as just the person who's here to show you a good time. I love it. Uh, And I really also, again, not just to shower you with compliments, but it's hard not to when you look at your business and how successful it is, is I think the way that you guys um, have, the strategy you guys have taken in terms of how to market and who to market to has, is very different than, than what we've seen elsewhere. You guys have done a really good job partnering with influencers and it's not always about necessarily people who may want to put money on a game. It's basically just, does this person like sports? And we've seen it even recently, you know, a a deal with the Kelsey's on their, on their podcast, a deal with the OGs, you know, down in South Florida and their podcast. And, you know, it's very clear that like, Hey, we're just looking for people who like sports and people who, uh, and finding people, finding a, a, a brand that has their own little tribal following And I think it's really unique that you blend that with still being able to do large partnerships with the NFL on, uh, on radio or all the different TV ads. But I think at the heart of it, from my perspective, a lot of those smaller, um, smaller deals that you might've done with influencers has paid off 10, you know, a hundred fold for you because those, those guys just, it's clear. Like I see it all over YouTube. Like it's, uh, everybody is, has got their communities and, and I really want to like give you and your team credit for noticing that and saying, Hey, we're not going to follow the the same, you know, blueprint that FanDuel and DraftKings did when trying to scale their fantasy products, because yours is very different and you recognize that. And, and I think you made some really good decisions along the way. I really appreciate that. And yeah, believe me, we got a whole team to thank for uh, the collective decision. I, I'm the one in my role that just needs to make sure that we are positioned to be directionally correct. And uh, as, as long as, you know, we infuse the right things in our DNA from day one and then, you know, adjust it along the way. You know, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, one thing that I thought you might be, be kind of veering into is the fact that this this product was actually originated as an add on to the season long format, right? But one of the things, and I should say more specifically, season long fantasy football leagues. Um, but one of the thing, bigger things that we learned over the years was that actually this is the product that has largely solved the void that was fantasy basketball. You know, fantasy basketball had never figured out. Like, you, you, see, you, you saw the NBA just rising in popularity and yet fantasy basketball was not. And, and I think that was largely attributed to the fact that there was never a format that was that you could really pair with it to really enhance the sports viewing experience. And I think that our simplified version of Daily Fantasy did just that because the, the common refrain is, do you think LeBron's going to drop 25 tonight or not? And, and that's the essence of our game. 
And, and so when you when you you know build a lineup of those predictions, um, you know it, it's it's something that a lot of basketball fans can really latch on to. So I, I get asked a lot because I love industry talk. You know, it's kind of what I grew up doing here on the, on this podcast long ago. And a lot of people are like, "What what's the storyline of 2024?" And in the in the world of uh, you know pay for play sports, fantasy sports, gambling, and for me, it's like, what is going to happen with Pick'em DFS? Because we have seen that the game has become under fire from regulators in a number of states, um, Michigan in particular, which is a story I, I don't even understand how all of a sudden for years you are looked at and as just perfectly fine fantasy product paid your, your, your taxes, like the other fantasy operators. And then one day they said, Nope, this, this is, this isn't what we meant. Even though for years you guys have been operating there. Uh, what is happening here? Why is Pick'em fantasy coming under fire from so many different gaming reg- regulators or attorney generals or whomever else is, is trying to, uh, you know, change the way, you know, people can play pick them fantasy out there. Why is this happening? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I called it out in, you know, in a recent interview uh, and I'll kind of repeat what, what I, what I said at one that was published at the beginning of the year. Um, what, what caught me by surprise was that uh, the States where uh, it became that much more debatable was the States where we already possessed licensing and we had already gone through all the price process to get licensed and be a good tax paying citizen. Uh, and so, you know, some things that came out were uh, that, that at this point are, are, have been proven factual is take, take Wyoming, right? There was a, uh, there was a cease and desist that was uh, sent to pick them operators out of Wyoming, but it was then, you know, discovered that there was a lobbyist on behalf of some of the incumbent daily fantasy operators that had specifically repeatedly uh, asked the AG to take action on our companies. Uh, and so um, let's just say, you know, the, the incumbents have been trying to, um, you know, you know, they, they've, they've been taking notice of our success and our growth and they've been, uh, you know, because they haven't felt comfortable uh, taking part in our category, they would, you know, rather resort to some anti-competitive behavior to try to, you know, s- you know squash our growth. Um, but, you know, as I also said, you know, the, were you about to say something? I mean, well, how does that how does that make you feel though, as somebody who was on the FSTA board for years, especially in 2015, 2016, where the FanDuel's and the DraftKings of the world were on the brink of going broke and having it banned all throughout the country? I mean, we all can remember back to that time where you know New York outlawed it. It seemed like we were on the brink of just losing DFS altogether. And you were part of this organization that, you know, brought people together, brought the operators together, brought the fans together and said, we're not going to let this happen. And now the same people that you worked with to, to achieve this goal, which made many of these people and these businesses worth, you know, billions of dollars are now like, no, we're, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to go against these guys because they're getting too big. From a personal side of things, I'd be pretty disappointed about that because I know you were in the, uh, you know, you were into it. Like this wasn't like you're just an outsider who started a, a pop- popular company. No, you were, uh, you know, fighting with these other businesses years ago. And now years later, it's like, ah, forget about that. Like, we're going to take you down because you're, you're becoming too big. That, that's got to be hard on you. I would think so a little bit from a personal angle. Yeah, and I, look, I appreciate you calling it out. Um, you know, I was <clears throat> to your point. I was on the FSGA board for five years, and and uh, you know, I was there when we put in place, you know, the the core values, and some of those core values were supporting being pro business and pro innovation. Uh, and so to see, you know, not only uh, certain operators be anti innovation and anti you know business and anti competitive, um, you know, look. The, the thing about our category that is that 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 I can't stress enough is that it's not a winner take all. You know, we we have direct competitors inside of our category and we're not being anti-competitive with them. 
you know, so so the, the some the approach that I could see why there was that angle was kind of infused in DFS salary cap because it was a little bit of a winner take all, you know, kind of um, you know category. But you don't have that with this one, and 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 this one, you know, at the end of the day, the people that that lose the most, especially when when games are taken away from them that they they love to play, are the sports fans, and I, and I think we're losing sight of that. You know, uh, while while there's these technical debates, you know, that are taking place, and and um, once again, you know, uh, ma- many of these debates that are you know being uh, de- you know discussed at the regulator level are not because many regulators woke up one morning and took issue with us. It's it's because they were seated by um, some other competitors that are just being anti-competitive. Yeah, and I think like we alluded to a little bit earlier is, you know, this prize picks arena game. Um, I feel like, and you alluded to it as much as you can, like, you know, this is, this is our quote unquote, not backup, but this is a way for us to understand what is happening and what could potentially happen further in the future and have a plan. So therefore we can still operate this game that people enjoy to play. And, you know, I'm not surprised to see it. It was just a matter of time. And uh, I hope everybody out there gives a chance. But I I want to kind of now move forward a little bit because there's one thing that's very obvious. Like, we may be pretty critical of them here today and some of the stuff we talked about. But FanDuel and DraftKings, without question, are the top two sports betting companies in the United States today. They both also came from the world of daily fantasy which is where Price Picks lives today. Price Picks is arguably bigger and definitely bigger than FanDuel and DraftKings were years ago. Probably bigger than them they are today if you looked in terms of of maybe pure users and the DFS side of things. So the question has to be like is there plans for Price Picks to make that 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 change like we've seen these other DFS operators make and and not necessarily pivot but offer a sports betting product because we've seen the success of brands, established brands make this change and become super, super successful. So I'm not expecting you to to say, yeah, we're going to do it tomorrow, but you can't be naive to the fact that, you know, we've seen this blueprint before and work and you guys right now are in a great, great position to potentially follow that lead. I can tie a number of things that we've discussed kind of, you know, together here, you know, Number one, one of the biggest reasons for our success to date has been our laser-like focus. We are as focused, if not more focused, than any other operator on just doing one thing and doing it incredibly well and being the best in the world at that. And um, and for that reason, it's why we can continue to iterate and innovate on that particular you know prediction type. In, in the case of ours, it's more or less on these player projections on a nightly basis. Um, <clears throat> In terms of, um, you know, one thing I did want to say about the peer-to-peer offering, because I, I do want to just, you know, um, make sure it's, it's it's properly framed. First and foremost, peer-to-peer is our expansion opportunity to continue right. to introduce real money gaming t- across the country and, and, and service other jurisdictions that we haven't been able to enter just yet. It also conveniently enough serves as a backup in case any of the regulatory environment changes. So I just wanted to, you know, call that out. But when you combine what we've got with our flagship game that we've been running for, you know, seven football seasons, this peer-to-peer product that, you know, obviously just came out just today that we're super excited about, and then the free-to-play product that we're going to continue to expand on um, as well, we would love nothing more than to stay in our existing lane. I also mentioned, you know, earlier, you know, we're an Atlanta-rooted Southern Focus company that just so happens to also serve, you know, a good bit of the, the rest of the country. But the fact of the matter is a great majority of the South to this day remains without the access to legal mobile betting options. You know, you guys have it in Tennessee. North Carolina is going to turn on before you know it. But you still got states like, you know, Georgia, Alabama, all the way out through Texas, the, you know, South Carolina. These states don't have access to legal mobile betting. Who knows when we're going to get them? So the way we think about our business is very much in line with kind of how do we best serve sports fans throughout the South? And, you know, that will help guide kind of our decision-making in the future. I think that is a very fair 
an interesting answer. And I, I still think it's it's a, a fascinating business to watch. And it's it's really cool to even see you grow as a as somebody because running a startup versus running a company at scale, I mean what's the what's the biggest differences for you because you're doing both like a lot of times it gets to a point where you're the startup you grow and then somebody else moves in but you've stuck in the ceo's chair the entire time so talk to me a little bit about the differences in running a business from those early days to now where you have seven million plus whatever that number is users on the platform yeah there, there's definitely a difference between being the founder and the ceo um, personally, I, th I think I, to be honest, I, I have a, a lean towards being the founder. That, that's that's where I really, um, you know, get the most amount of joy. Um, you know, what, what comes along with the CEO of being a company at our scale and size these days, there's a lot more things to manage. Uh, you know, there's a lot more people to manage. There's a lot more dynamics to manage. There's just a lot more in general to manage. Uh, and so, um you know, we, we you know we're, we're we're a big boy company at this point, and and we've got to um, you know you know, understand what comes along with the territory. What's also great is um, you know with this with the state of this business, we're able to grow, recruit some incredible talent. So so the people that we've brought on board, especially over the last year, um, you know, just the caliber uh, of people across our organization from you know not just within the industry, but you know we're. We're bringing in people that have, you know, places like Meta and Uber and, and, and you know, all the, all the great media companies, you know, into this business. Um, you know, there's so many great, you know, minds at the table now. And uh, once again, it's my job just to make sure that we're, we're going directionally correct. And uh, I trust that uh, the team's got it from there, largely speaking. Well, looking at the success of the business, I think uh, you're guiding it in the right spot and the the team is executing because the growth is phenomenal, bigger than I would have ever thought. And uh, I think it's it's just the beginning too, depending on what the future looks like in the, the real money gaming space. So Adam, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to talk again. We've had these conversations in the past. First time we've done it, I think maybe ever in a podcast, but uh, congrats on all the success. I'm excited to get back into the prize pick streets here in Tennessee with the new prize picks, uh, arena game. So again, that's West Virginia, Tennessee, Wyoming, Alabama, and likely more to come down the road. So, uh, keep your, your ears out and, uh, be sure to check out that, uh, prize picks app. Thanks again, Adam. Uh, great conversation, my man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dan.